So Akara Khan has been my main opening against 1e4 for as long as I can remember and it played a big role in helping me go from 1900 to 2200 where I am today. And today I want to distill 32 of the most important ideas in the opening and typical mill game positions in the Akara Khan and this will help you guys who already play the Akara Khan get further kind of acquainted with the various ideas possible or for those of you who want to get started playing the Akara Khan this video will also be very useful. Without further ado, let's get right into the first bunch of ideas in the advanced variation. So the very first idea I want to show is in the advanced variation here, where a very common idea after black develops the bishop out to f5, by the way, a very common move also is to play c5, we'll cover this a bit soon. Bishop f5 is a very logical move, getting the bishop outside the pawn chain here, and a very typical mistake which happens a lot at the club level is bishop d3 here. And the reason this is a mistake is because when white plays this move, essentially what we have to compare this to is the French defense. This is basically what we're going to compare it to, where very often black has this sort of bad knight squared bishop, which often has troubles kind of gain into the game because it's blocked out this pawn chain. Whereas in the Karo Khan we solve that problem here by getting the bishop outside very early and what white should not do in response to this is sort of let black achieve a very good version of the French defense by playing bishop d3 here because after takes takes now e6 black's gonna play c5 very soon like they do in the French advance variation and essentially what we have here is we no longer have this bishop on c8 so we have a French defense uh, with all, you know, the good factors without the problem bishop on c8, which makes this position very pleasant for black and not something that white should willingly go into so easily. And for that reason, one of the main lines actually for white in the Karo Khan advanced variation is to go knight of 3 here, e6, and again, not bishop d3, a very common move, and instead bishop e2, avoiding that trade here, and something that happens very often is white might play knight h4 at some point, harassing this bishop, of course that's not possible right now because of queen takes h4, or you might also eventually like move the knight somewhere and then start pushing your king's side pawns to harass this bishop on f5. And so following up from the last example, another very similar line is c5 here, and basically the best move for white is to play d takes c5, because black has spent two tempi playing with their c pawn here, so this is kind of the most principled way that white can try and punish black. But a lot of people don't do that, they just play c3, they just kind of go along for the flow, and let black develop the bishop to the very active g4 square here, and the problem is, is that this is once again a very kind of good version of the French defense for black here. And some further moves that I had from an old game of mine to illustrate this is I played knight g7 here. By the way, it is a bit more accurate to play c takes d4 immediately because in playing knight g7, you allow white to play d takes d5 with similar kind of ideas that we saw earlier on this move, but white is trying to exploit the fact that black's playing a bit slowly. But anyways, in the game, my opponent didn't exploit this. I was just able to develop my pieces very active squares. And I was able to get very nice pressure on this this d4 point and it's important to note that if my bishop was once again back on the c8 square I wouldn't have such tremendous pressure on this d4 square and white could probably play move like knight b3 and be fine but that's just not the case here. And so coming back to this position we saw earlier we looked at how black could play something like e6 and c5 which leads to a very good version of the French defense. But a very cool idea that pops up in a bunch of these variations is black can actually play queen a5 check, a sneaky uh, somewhat stupid looking check actually because you know typically we're taught we shouldn't just play one move threats right and this is kind of what this check looks like but it actually has a deeper idea that after bishop d2 here we're going to play this move queen a6. And the basic idea is that if white trades queens which I don't think they should to be honest after something like queen takes a6, knight takes a6 this endgame is very poor wasn't for black, once again they don't have the problem of their bad white squid bishop, white actually has a bad dark squid bishop here, so strategically black definitely has a bit of an advantage here, we're going to play e6, c5, maybe bring this knight to c6 here, and we have a very pleasant position. And another very common line which this occurs actually is after h4, h5, bishop d3, takes takes, and now here once again we play queen a5 check, there's some deeper theoretical reasons as to why we play this check, but again uh, we have this idea here, we go queen a6. So once again on the topic of this pawn move h4 here, it's important that we discuss this and what black should do in such a scenario. We just saw the black played h5 but why is this? And for starters here, if black plays this move e6 here, g4 is very strong here. If bishop e4 we go f3 and then h5 and now bishop is just trapped so this is obviously something we want to avoid. But you might also ask why don't we just play h6 here? h5 looks like it kind of creates a weak pawn there, why are we doing that? And the answer is very concrete actually, if black plays g4 here, and white tries to retreat the sorry black tries to retreat the bishop to h7 here we run into a very nasty move here e6 it's important to understand that if black were allowed to play e6 c5 and knight c6 here these pawn moves would just kind of be very weakening and 
I, I'd say the black would even be the one who's better. However, that's not the case here, and white can play his very nice move e6, clamping down on the square here, and if black takes this, which they're almost forced to, maybe they could move the queen or something like that, but takes is what usually happens. Bishop d3, and say we have an exchange like this here, what we get is a position where we notice how because white sacrificed a pawn here and this pawn is deflected away from protecting the g6 square, black has incredible weaknesses around their king here and they're going to be in a bit of trouble. However, coming back to this position after h4, that is why black plays h5 here. We just simply want to stop all these g4 shenanigans here and in general, black is doing quite solid, although there is some more stuff, but more on that later. So we just looked at white's very aggressive ideas with h4 and if allowed they'd love to play g4 but there's another very similar line like can go knight c3 here e6 g4 bishop g6 and now they usually play knight g2 and h4 which we're going to look at but first of all why do they do that why don't they just play h4 immediately and the point is that we can actually just play this very nice move h5 here and if white takes this for example bishop takes h5 and strategically this is just a much better position for black here white has this weak pawn on h4 we have very nice control of the f5 square like for example if allowed here like i don't know let's say white played a move like knight of which is awful look at this pin here we're going to play a move like c5 knight c6 add pressure to d4 pawn knight e7 knight f5 this is an amazing position for black here and coming back to this position here if white instead doesn't take this and instead plays a move like g5 uh you might think white's gaining all this space but you have to realize once again they're moving these pawns forward and they're creating a lot of weaknesses in particular the square on f5 is a very big weakness now which White's never going to be able to cover really, we're just going to be able to play moves like knight e7, c5, knight c6, really target uh, the center here, and also note that because we have this sort of blockade on the knight squares here, it's going to be very difficult for white to ever really crack our king side. For example, uh, one construction that I like is, let's say something like this ever happens, we don't need to play g6, but it just really nicely illustrates here how it's going to be so difficult for white to actually crack through, like it's just not happening, right? Like if this pawn, for example, was still on g4 or something, maybe they could possibly play f4 and f5 here, but that's obviously just going to lose a pawn in any scenario like this, which is why white will usually play this move knight g2 first, preparing this move h4, and this is where, you know, black will play c5, counter-attacking in the sense, because, you know, white's been doing a bunch of weird-looking stuff. There's h4, and again, we don't want to play h6 here. This is going to kind of play into white's hands here. They're going to play bishop e3, h5, queen d2, f4, become very active. So instead, black tries to actively counter-attack white's plan here. We want to play h5 here. And we even do this at the expense of white playing knight f4 here and gaining the pawn like this. I should also note that we do not want to play h takes g4 here because after knight takes g6, queen takes and something like this here, we have a very strategically suspect position. We might have to do something like this here and sort of hold on for dear life onto this g6 pawn, but I don't even think this really works as rook g1 still and this is a very nasty threat here. But basically the idea is this position after knight f4 might look like white winning a pawn, but I mean look what they've done with this knight right like it's on the edge of the board now sure there's some maybe tactical stuff that can happen but in general we're just going to play knight c6 be a very good compensation for the pawn with our speedy development here and black is a very nice position and so now I'm looking at some more strategic variations rather than those where white kind of tries to kill black right off the bat here we're going to look at the, once again these lines of knight f3 and bishop e2 this is called the short system by the way Named after Nigel Short, I believe, who really popularized these setups, uh, instead of White trying to go for a lot of these, you know, really sharp attacks, he popularized this more kind of slow approach where you just kind of slowly try and use the space advantage you have in the center and slowly try and strangle Black here. And I'm not going to try and show any like specific theory against this. If you're interested, I actually made a video uh, of a game I played a while ago, but I essentially played this interesting line where I played Knight G6 here. I went for a quick F6 and broke in the center. This is a very aggressive line if you're interested. But one idea that I want to show here is Knight G6. Seven, and basically what we're going to do very often the Karakhan is we have to deal with like the fact that our pieces sort of have a lot of conflict with each other for example this knight would love to go to the f5 square with the bishop seeing there and you know we could do something like h6 bishop h7 knight f5 but even then the pieces still kind of stepping on each other's toes and we also have to deal with the fact this bishop wouldn't like to develop itself, this knight can't just sit on e7 forever. So one very common way of dealing with that problem is to play knight c8, bring this knight to the b6 square, and only then play bishop e7, and this is a very kind of interesting sub, which can be used in many different scenarios in the Karakhan. However, changing sides a bit, I think it's important to really consider, even though you know you might be playing the Karakhan, just from the black side, it's also important to understand some of white's ideas 
And from the black perspective, I should also note that long run we would love to play c5 and break in the center. If we play c5 immediately, there's a bunch of like sharp fury that happens here, and you might not really want to enter this, but you also have to understand that delaying c5, it can be a little bit risky, like if you try and go into this position which we just saw earlier, we saw knight c8, but what if black plays something like c5 in this position here? And the answer is that, you know, if white tries to play something like c3, once again, this will enter a very nice version of the French defense uh, for black here. This isn't really anything challenging, black should be very happy if they achieve this, but instead a much more challenging approach for white is, okay, if they play d takes c5, this doesn't really work as well because knight takes c5 is possible here, but the very nice options just blow the center up immediately, try go for something like c4 here. And even though it might seem like, you know, maybe black can win a pawn or something like c takes d4, knight takes e5, because black is kind of behind development, the king is still in the center, this is extremely risky and white can gain a very quick initiative with some specific concrete moves in this scenario where they can play e takes d5. And once again, even though white's now a pawn here, it's actually them who has the advantage because after, for example, e takes d5, we can play something like knight b3, maybe there's knight c5 ideas, knight c6 here we can take and play bishop e3, put pressure on the d5 pawn here, and really it's not a very easy position for black to play at all, the king is in the center, we also have, once again have the bishop here, not the most fun thing in the world. Well, once again, coming back to this position, we looked at knight c8, c5, we understand that might not be so good, but another cool idea that I really like myself is to play something like h6 here, and if knight b3 from white here, a very cool idea is to play g5, and remember how I said earlier, like this bishop on e7, sorry, this bishop on f8, it would love to come to e7, but this knight's kind of just sitting there, being a pain in the ass, we can actually develop this bishop to the g7 square when we do this, and later on, we're going to castle, play f6, counterattack in the center like that. And in general, these positions are very double edged, and it's a very exciting way to play the Karakhan. And to go a little bit deeper into the middle game here, I just want to show a game where I played this move knight c8 here and bishop e7. And the idea I really want to show off here is you know, I've executed this whole uh, maneuver here with the knight going to b6. And here, once again, white plays this move knight of d2. And I kind of mentioned this in the very first part of the advanced variation. Ideas right where white might want to move the knight out of the way and then play something like g4 and f4 and really try and exploit the fact that, because like in the French defense, right, this bishop on c8. And even though it is kind of a bad bishop here, there is some problems with the bishop being outside of the pawn chain, namely that white can use that as a target for their pawns to kind of attack and gain an attack very quickly here. But when white does move their knight backward like this trying to prepare such a pawn storm, what we can do is counter attack in the center with a move like f6 here. And say after a move like f4 here, you can now follow up with something like c5, gaining more counterplay in the center. I've actually used this game as an example in a couple videos, like for example, reprogram your chess brain materialism, where after my opponent played a4 here, I played the very aggressive d4 here, and after c6, d4, knight, d5, but if you're interested in that, I recommend go checking out that video. So having discussed a very critical advanced variation, which is of course one of the most common ways that you can play against Kara Khan, I want to discuss many of the ideas that are important to note in the classical variation, which is what happens after white plays knight c3, or knight d2 actually they basically transpose because after d takes e4, knight takes e4, it's the same thing, right? And here I'm going to mainly be focusing on bishop f5, I believe this is really the cornerstone of the classical variation, to me it's always been the true way that you play the Kara Khan, I've also dabbled with knight f6, and some of the ideas will still be relevant to that, but it's not going to be the main focus. But basically a very common continuation after this bishop f5 moves knight g3 here, kicking the bishop back, so bishop g6, knight f3, uh, and the most critical lines uh, happen after h4, actually h6, h5, and we get this position, but basically what white sometimes does is they don't even bother playing this move h4, h5, they want something more positional and they go bishop d3, fair enough, whereas h4 is kind of more aggressive, and it's important to note in these lines here, first off the bat, that Compared to these lines where white plays bishop d3, bishop takes h7 is actually a real threat since if we had to recapture with our rook here, that means we couldn't castle. Whereas if bishop d3 in this position here, we're actually not that fast if white plays bishop takes g6, because after h takes g6, we might have double pawns, but our pawn structure is still very solid here. The h file gets open for our rook for one thing, so it's not all that bad. So in this small example, e6, castle is knight gf6, we just play some very solid developing moves here. Bishop d6 is also possible, that is worth noting, rc4 here, castles, and white might play bishop takes g6 is a very sensible move, 
And in these positions here, we play rook e8, bringing the rook. It might be useful one day. We might want to play e5. Of course, right now, that's a bit of a far-fetched dream, but it could be possible in the future. Queen c2. And there are various different ideas in the position. But what everything comes down to ultimately is black eventually playing c5, breaking in the center like this. Like, you might not want to do it immediately. You could also try and play something like queen b6 or queen a5, only then play rook a d8, maybe one day even double rooks in the default. But at some point, you probably will have to play c5, really sort of resolving a lot of the space advantages that white has in the center. And for example, you have rook a d1, c takes d4, knight takes d4, now you can move the queen somewhere, bring the rook to c8 maybe, rook a d8, and hopefully the dream is to eventually play e5 and really start getting the pawns rolling in the center one day. But coming back to this position, right, it's important to also talk about this move h4. This is something we're going to focus on a lot. And what happens if, you know, white just starts going crazy, right? They play h5, they do all this stuff. What do we do in such a position here? And basically, our plan is very similar to what we did against the short castle line. We just want to play knight gf6 and bishop e7 and castle short. And now these positions, they're not as positional, right, because it's opposite side castling, but this is sort of the modern approach to playing the Karakhan. What people used to do is they used to play like queen c7 and castling long, but these variations are just not as fun. White tends to get a very nice slight advantage if they know what they're doing, whereas in the other line, uh, things are just a lot more complicated. I also find it a lot more fun, whereas these lines, not as much. However, coming back to this position here, it's very important to note, by the way, However, coming back to this position here, which once again we reach via these moves h4, h6. Also, I'm going to note here that we don't want to play h5 in these lines because compared to playing in the advanced variation like this line back here, right, where, you know, there was this h4 stuff, h5 here. Why in this position are we not playing h5? And, well, one, it kind of feels a little bit awkward putting our, shoving our bishop up against this kind of wall here where it's kind of jammed in between all these pawns. It feels a little bit awkward uh, but more concretely in these lines here if we continue down a similar path here what we're going to notice is that essentially say we get a very similar position is that white can use this g5 square in a very nasty way in all of these positions like if we play knight g5 this e6 square is very tender this f7 pawn is also quite weak in general it's just very unnecessary to allow this sort of counterplay here White has a very nasty attacking position here, and I would not want to be black. Whereas when we play h6, those kind of possibilities are eliminated. No knight is going to be easily hopping into the g5 square. And so continuing on in this line here, we have h5, bishop d3 takes, takes, takes. And in this position here, bishop d2 is kind of the modern main line, but it's important to understand why. And basically, to understand why, let's go look at bishop f4 here. And if queen a5 check, which is the best move in this position here, provoking white to kind of do something. Note also that, you know, when white has pushed their h pawn down to h5 here, they no longer want to castle kingside because otherwise, you know, imagine this, we put like knight gf6. What if they castle kingside here? Well, they simply just lose the h5 pawn. So obviously, when you take that into mind, it, it's not so great. And if they don't castle, you know, kingside here, I mean, what are they going to do? Castle queenside. But notice how they move this pawn in front of the king now, c3. This makes it very, you know, apart from the fact they just hang the a2 pawn, it, it's obviously just going to be a bit risky. Risky, which is why in this position white tries to play bishop d2 and their goal is for black to play queen c7 but notice how this is a very similar position we just looked at uh in this position here where black played queen c7 long castles and this was the old main line i was talking about that we don't want to go into so after queen a5 bishop d2 here uh we don't want to play queen c7 we actually want to play this very aggressive move bishop b4 here aggressive i, I don't know but you get what i mean right where we're trying to provoke white to play this move c3, but in doing so, once again, we've induced white to play in this move, which weakens their queen side after bishop e7, c4. They finally kick in the queen away. By the way, we don't want to go uh, with bishop b4 here, because then knight e4 here. And this is getting a bit complicated. You don't have to fully follow along, but the difference between the pawn being on c4 here and the pawn being on c2 in this position is that now knight e4 doesn't work so well because of knight gf6. And this whole line just doesn't really work that great because, you know, black, this stuff all kind of works out for them. They're going to win back the material. Whereas in this line, when white gets in c4 here, bishop b4, knight e4, this doesn't work too well because now after something like this here, white can go something like c5, uses knight as an outpost on d6 square. And this is extremely, extremely unpleasant for, for black here, which is why we don't play bishop b4 back in this position. We instead play queen c7. And basically, Taking stock of what has just happened, we now have a similar situation to this line here we just talked about earlier, except we provoke this pawn two squares forward, which makes these positions a lot more risky to play from white's perspective here. 
But to illustrate some of these ideas more, here's a game I had from this exact line actually, where, you know, White had brought their pawns forward a bunch, things didn't exactly go so greatly in the opening, and now it's sort of up to Black to try and figure out what to do here. And in the game I was sort of considering something like a5 here, I'd love for the a file to be open for my rook here, but after something like b5 from White here, they keep the a file closed, they also no longer have the pawn on b4 being so weak anymore, so this didn't greatly appeal to me. Maybe I could play bishop b4 check, maybe I have something here, I could probably take and follow up with rook c8, it's probably still maybe good, but I didn't really look that far in the game here. What I saw was a lot more of a clean solution was, once again, you could maybe play something like bishop f6, but still after bishop e3, you have to really make a decision with what are you actually doing in your position with your pawns, because you can move the pieces around as much as you want, but eventually you're going to have to make some kind of pawn break. And the pawn break in this position that you guys really, I want really to remember, if you remember one thing in this video about the classical variation, it's going to be this pawn break b5 here. Very key idea, if y takes this, terrible move here, we open up the c file now for our rook, we can maybe bring a rook to c4, target this pawn, target this pawn, a5 if we want. Everything in the world is in our hands here. This is an absolutely terrible position for white here. Black's probably already winning. And the game here, what happened was white instead played c5. And now there are a couple important things that have happened in the position. And the biggest one, I believe, is the d5 square is free for our pieces. A rook could come here, a knight could come there, a queen if a queen was still on the board, we'd love to hop into that square. And basically this is just a very pleasant position for black. But once again we should be a little bit careful because of something like knight e5, targeting the c6 pawn, that could kind of end a bit bad. So we played bishop f6 first, once again targeting this pawn here, and if something like rook d3 from white here we play a5. But notice how if we compare a couple moves earlier to this position, uh, where we looked at a5 here and white could play b5, notice how in this position that just simply is not possible because this b pawn is blockading the b pawn on b4. And if white tries to play something like Avery, trying to hold the structure together, it just doesn't really work because we get a takes b4 takes and rook a1. And if white plays rook d1 here, well, they can say goodbye to their rook here because it is hanging. And to further reinforce this idea, and a lot more of a typical scenario in which it will actually come into play, is once again in this variation here, we play queen f5 check, bishop d2, do all this stuff here, and we bring our queen back to c7, of course, knight gf6. Short castles, very important. We don't want to castle along, that would kind of make the game a lot more boring here. Short castle, bishop c3, not such a good move, and we're going to see why. And if, once again, you want to pause the video and try and figure out what black's move is, I suggest you do so. But the point is, like, okay, we could bring out rooks to the d file, we could do something like that, but a much more to the point move is to play this move b5 here, counter attacking in the queen side here, and trying to really challenge white's control over the light squares. Like for example, they play c5 here, we can go a5, this d5 square is weak, our knight can come to the square. Also a very cool idea is maybe we can bring a rook to the d file here, and if white's not careful, they just play a move like rook h1 here, we can play knight takes c5 here, and we just simply win a pawn due to the pin here. But a5 is a lot more consistent move here, we can play b4 maybe at some point, kick uh, the bishop away, gain counterplay on the queen side here, and all in all, I really like black's position here. And you might be asking, well, after b5 here, why are we looking at c5? Why aren't we just taking this pawn? Isn't it a free pawn? And well, no, it's not, because after c6, b5 here, they have to take the queen if they want to really make sense of this whole line. Uh, but the problem is now rook ab8, we gain a tempo, knight d5, another threat here, maybe they move the king to a1, rook fc8. And if you really take stock of this position here, we have an opposite side casting position, and uh, look at our pieces on the queen side, and look at what white's doing on the king side. Their king side attack hasn't begun, we're about to like deliver maid or something on the queen side. Obviously there's a huge disparity in the attack here, and this is of course not a position that you'd want to be in the white pieces. So we've looked at a bunch of ideas here where white can play bishop f4, we get all this queen f5 check stuff, but after bishop d2, again I'm not trying to make this the most theoretical video in the world, I'm just really trying to distill a bunch of important ideas, knight gf6, long castles, bishop e7 here, a very important idea that can occur in a bunch of these positions here is black can play this move queen d5 after these knight trades, and basically we pressure this a2 pawn, that is one thing, but another thing is that we can play this move after c4 here, a bunch of people might just be like, oh, okay we might have to retreat now, but no, we can go forward here, put queen a4 here, and try and initiate a queen trade here. And after a move like queen takes e4, and i takes e4, we should e3. In this specific position here, like okay we could castle short, but the very cool idea is we can play f5, a very aggressive move, threatening to play f4 here, like if white just doesn't pay any attention, we play f4 here, kick the bishop away, and we can take on f2 here, 
fork these rooks here and this is looking pretty sweet. And another very cool idea that I remember when learning the Kara Khan here is that if white instead, you know, tries to play g3 stopping f4 ideas from black here, a very cool idea that black has up this sleeve is bishop g5. And essentially what we're saying is, okay, if you take this with the bishop, well, then this is very soft. If you, I mean, with the rook there, like we can go g4, king f7, double the rooks on the h file, not looking so good, buddy. And if you try to play something like um, in this position, knight takes g5, well, again, I mean, we're, okay, the f2 pawn, that's protected at least, but we can still play king f7, double the rooks on the h file. You have some kind of problem to deal with here. But once again, also, it's very common in the Karakhan to just like castle or something, bring the rooks to the center, eventually play c5, and you have a very like kind of typical endgame for the Karakhan. And so, so far, I've shown a lot of the good sides of the classical variation the queen trades, the, the b5 breaks, but I haven't really showed what happens if white tries to be aggressive and, and really just tries to take black by the neck here. And one very common way they can do this is, you know, bringing the knight to e4 uh, and clearing the way for the g4 pawn here. That's a very important idea you need to keep in mind here. And so typically what black will do here is they'll bring a rook to the center. They could exchange, but I also like something like this here. And white might try to prepare this move g4 by playing this move rook hg1 here. Uh, they could also sack the pawn immediately, but uh, there's, you know, some very sharp stuff here. Like for example, knight takes g4. You might have something like rook hg1, f5, and the stuff just starts going crazy. But rook hg1, and here we really have to ask ourselves, what are we doing? Because if we allow g4, g5, it could get really scary very quickly. So one of the really cool ideas that black has at the disposal here is to play this move knight g4, blockading the g pawn now, and it's actually very difficult for white to do anything about this and get their king side attack going. And the meanwhile, while white's kind of, you know, figuring out what to do here, we can play c5 and start getting counterplay in the center here. And once again, I want to switch sides up a little bit, take it, things from white's perspective here, and show an aggressive possibility where instead of going knight e4, which we've seen in one of these variations, why could try something a little bit more subtle, like queen e2 here, and after castles here, a very common try is for white to once again not play knight e4, that wouldn't really make much sense here either, since we'd have to spend like, you know, all these tempo moving our queens around, that just, why? Uh, so what white usually will do here is instead play this move knight f1, which might look a little bit weird on the surface, right, like why would you move the knight back to the first rank? That kind of looks stupid, but the more kind of not so subtle idea, shall I say, is to play g4, g5, and absolutely murder black on the king side. And for you fury junkies out here, I'm just gonna, you know, continue the line a little bit because there's actually a cool force draw here after c takes d4, g5, knight d5. By the way, this isn't like some computerish, I mean, it is sort of a computerish line, but it's been known like 20, 30 years or something. There's like tons of games in the database where people have actually played this out, but basically we have these moves here. Where black will play the very nice bishop a3 move, counter-attacking on the queen side here, completely ignoring what white's doing on the king side here. Rook takes g7, king h8, and we just say, you know what, white, go ahead, do your stuff. You can't hurt me. And I mean, they're right, because after knight c3 here, uh, we are friending queen b1 check in addition to attacking the queen here. If white takes this, B takes e3 here, sorry, D takes e3, queen b2 is a mate threat, and you can take the knight in d7, but that's gonna run into mate. So essentially, what well, it might even look like, I mean, white's losing here, but that's not the case because after uh, these moves here, white can play rook h7 check here, and we have a repetition of moves. By the way, you don't wanna play uh, a move like king takes h7 for black here because after queen d3 check, something like this, there's queen takes e3. Now we've defended against all these mate threats, and uh, this king might actually be in a bit of trouble. So once again, a very familiar position on the board here. By the way, this is idea number 18. We're more than halfway through. Keep going with me. Uh, and here, you know, white can play rook he1 here. Rook did a bunch of different stuff. But this is a very logical idea, just bringing the rook to the center here. And one idea which I want you guys to be aware of in these positions is white playing something like knight f5 here, trying to target this bishop on e7 here. And this might look very scary. You might freak out thinking you've messed up here. But no need to fret and, you know, go hysterical here. Very often in these positions, you can actually simply take this knight on f5 here. And if a move like rook takes e7 here, we can play this move queen d8, kicking the rook back out, and after a move like rook e2, knight e4 here. And our knight actually has a very nice outpost on the e4 square. We can bring our rook to e8, maybe queen to f6, centralize our pieces. And overall, all in all, I'd say that black is pretty solid here. So another similar position, this time though, in civil king knight f5, which in this case could be met with e takes f5. There's also like bishop b4 here, and I think there might even be some crazy sacrifice lines after this. But what I really want to look at were these lines 
where white goes knight e5 and how to respond to this because if you just kind of chop the, the knight off here without thinking here white can play d takes e5 and after knight d5 knight e4 and once again they can move this g pawn now g4 g5 and it's not easy at least to me uh to really kind of counter this attack here and i think white just has a big advantage here so a natural idea coming back to this position after knight e5 might be to play something like rook f d8 here kind of lining this rook up with the queen on the d file here for example if knight e4 this would be a catastrophic wonder because knight takes e5 takes takes and uh, I mean, you can't really take because I mean, the, the queen would just hang, right? However, there is a problem with this move rook fd8, keeping the tension in this way. However, when the rook has left this f8 square and gone to d8, it is no longer defending the f7 pawn, which might seem kind of trivial, like what's a big deal? Until you consider the fact that white can actually sacrifice a piece here, and after king takes f7, go queen g6 check. And if the rook recaptured, this once again would not be happening. But now after king f8, rook takes e6, knight f5 is coming, rook e1, doubling rooks in e5 might be happening. All in all, not a position I'd want to have on the board with black. White really probably just has a decisive advantage, and even something like bishop takes h6 as well is another threat. Very dangerous position I think black's probably already losing. So with all that in mind, the, the best move for black in this position to really to kind of handle this move knight e5, which pops up in a bunch of different variations, is to go rook a d8 if we ever face something like knight takes f7 now. Rook takes f7 simply handles all of that, no big deal. And also to illustrate what happens if white kind of does nothing to keep the tension, uh, well what we're going to do is we're just simply going to keep reinforcing the pressure in the center with a move like c5, adding pressure to this pawn here. If uh, white takes here, I think knight takes e5, I'm not 100% sure whether it works or not, but bishop takes e5 looks quite good. Uh, now knight takes e5 is a real threat here, and bishop takes f2 is also on the board. And so really getting into some of the theoretical weeds here, I, I, once again, I'm not trying to make this some like, you know, theory mask class or something, but it just happens to be a theoretical idea that also is important to understand strategically uh, in this line here, where I go to knight e4, knight f6, queen d5, and here what white will sometimes do is play bishop e3 preemptively, you know, once again, our idea was to play queen e4 here, and white kind of preemptively prevents that. If we go queen e4 now, for example, they'll probably just play knight e2, quick our queen around. If we dare take this, they're gonna like bring their rook to the g file now, if we retreat, there's like bishop takes h6, something you probably want to avoid, which really forces black to find something else to do in this position. And there's a bunch of tries like knight g4 once again, blockading the g pawn, b5 is an option uh but one very cool idea that i like is queen b5 here and basically we're saying you know once again by uh i'm down for the queen exchange uh but this time if you exchange it you're gonna have to be very careful because you're creating some serious I'm, I'm not sure weaknesses but at the very least black has some knight outputs in the position like our knight can come to d5 rook maybe can come, come to c4 here we have some nice positional pressure on the queen side here uh so white definitely has to be a little bit careful about going into this which is why the main move for white in this position is to play c4 here and you might kind of be like, well, what was that idea, right? This looks kind of stupid, just letting our queen get chased around. But concretely speaking, we have this idea queen f5 check and c5 gain counterplay in the center here. And this is actually all fine for black here. I've had this position, I think, twice over the board here, even though like we're 20 moves deep already. So like if you're a bit higher on the rating ladder and you want to like analyze lines, big bishop e3, this is something to keep in mind. But otherwise, just keep in mind the idea of queen b5, strategically speaking, is not bad. And to wrap up with the classical variation, we've looked a lot at these ideas with h4 and stuff, which is very important and crucial to understand if you're going to play these lines, because these are kind of the kind of heart of this whole variation, right? But some people will also play this very tricky looking move knight e2, or knight h3. It basically is the same idea here, where the knight is going to come to the square f4. But what's the idea, right? By doing this, I mean, it looks kind of fancy. And the, the idea, by the way, is not for white to just take this. If this does happen, I mean, you know, like there's been all these tempi with the knight just to take the bishop there. Big deal, right? Sure, white has a bishop here, we just play e6, bishop d6, queen c7. We could castle short, maybe we could like even, even castle queen side here, and I mean, black's doing fairly solid. But the thing we really have to watch out for is what happens if white plays h4 here, just running to trap our bishop with h5. It's not all clear what we do here. If we play e6, I mean, well, you know, just h5 here, Um, and my computer's taking a bit of time to load this. Okay, there we go, bishop e4 here, f3, and I mean, our bishop gets trapped like this, obviously not something we want on the board. But obviously if we play a move like h6 here, this also isn't ideal because then white can simply take this, uh, and we have a very weak pawn on g6, e6 square is also very weak, we would love to not go into this. Which brings us to white's best move in this position, which is, sorry, black's best move, which is to play e5, counter-attacking immediately in the center here, 
And now if white, well I mean obviously we're forcing white to make a good choice, do they take this, do they take this? The best move is probably for them to take this one, but then after queen a5 check here, notice how we are forking the king and pawn here, bishop d2, queen takes e5 here, and something immediately to note is if queen e2, we get bishop takes e2, and the bishop escape here, and if something like uh, bishop e2 here, then bishop c5, if they play h5, we get bishop e4, and there's simply no way they're going to be trapping the bishop at this point, like f3 for example, that looks extremely risky, bishop d5 here, like, they just can't keep chasing our bishop around, eventually it will be safe here, and look at all the weaknesses they created in the process. Alright, so we've looked at 21 ideas now in the classical and advanced variations, the two most critical variations that, like, if you know how to play against those, you're going to be doing really good, but you also really have to understand how do you play against some of the less critical variations, and I wanted to look at the exchange variation here with e takes d5, and I should specify that the exchange variation uh, well, there's two kind of different lines here that I can go for. In the panel here, I wouldn't really call this the exchange variation. The exchange variation is more bishop d3, knight f3, c3, anything that kind of fits into that sort of thing. And so I want to talk about the exchange variation right now. So bishop d3 is the most uh, kind of accurate move order here. And the reason is that knight f3, which a lot of players do, actually is not so good because it allows black to activate their bishop outside the pawn chain very easily. One very common mistake after bishop d3 a lot of players make is not following up with c3. This is once again a very important key because if you play knight f3, it's not so different from playing knight f3 immediately where after knight c6, you know, we have this thing with bishop g4 and that's essentially a transposition to this position where we're going to play bishop g4 right this if you get this on the board you've pretty much already equalized and you should have a good game i'm going to go a little bit further and show some of the key ideas here so basically you have to understand why well, it's probably going to play c3 at some point uh e6 i should also note that if they castle here you might be tempted to simply win a pawn here uh but it doesn't quite work like that i think you can play bishop takes every win a pawn like this that looks okay, uh, but you have to be very careful about winning a pawn like bishop, sorry, knight takes d4, because if you want to try and pause the video and figure it out, I suggest you do so. But the idea here is that after knight takes d4 here, you might just kind of sit there and be like, okay, well, I'm winning a queen, so what? But not so what, because after bishop b5 check here, we're forced to give our queen back, and if you look at the resulting position now, why is this simply going to be a piece up after they win back the queen? So look out for that trap here, but as long as you just play e6 here, now knight takes c4 is a serious threat, or like once again, you could probably just win a pawn like this, I think this worked, c3 here, and the key idea is once again, we're going to continue developing in this fashion here, we could play knight f6, but I like knight g7 a little bit more here, uh, rook e1, and when you put the knight on e7 though, you have to be very careful to not castle immediately, and the idea once again, if you want to try and pause the video, I suggest you do so, is to play bishop takes h7 check here, and now if we take here as knight g5, and um, I mean, not so great. So what black would much rather do in such a position is instead try and prepare castle with a move like h6, or you could even play something like uh, queen c7, long castle even, but one, let's say my bishop h5, this is a very uh, typical idea here, and what we're going to probably do is like castles, uh, maybe queen d7 protecting this e6 pawn, you might say why the e6 pawn, and the point is, is that very often in these positions we want to play f6 and e5, this is the whole idea of why we put the knight on e7 not f6, uh, so we can gain central counterplay like this. However, if you were to go for something like knight f6, this is perfectly playable, uh, a plan that you would typically go for in such a position like this is instead to go for what we would call the minority attack with something like rook b8, b5, and the goal is to eventually play b4, take on c3, and create a backward isolated pawn, well I don't think it's isolated, but a backward pawn on c3 that we can use as a long term uh, weakness to attack. Or if possible, the kind of third plan I guess you would say in this position is to play e5 and break in the center like this, but you have to be a little bit careful about doing this because like, uh, if you don't get something concrete out of this, like say in this structure here, you might just get sort of saddled with an isolated queen's pawn, which isn't necessarily terrible, but you know, I would kind of want a good reason for giving myself this isolated pawn, so, you know, if there's nothing concrete, I would be a little bit wary of going for this. And, you know, like, overall, I'd say that a lot of people who play the exchange variation, like, hardly any really know what they're doing, a lot don't really, especially in lower levels, do not play bishop d3 and c3, this is the best way by far to play the exchange variation, a lot of people, they'll play knight f3, and some people here, what they will do is not even play bishop d3, but they will actually play a move like knight c3 here, which is just bad in every sense of the position, the knight should not be blocking the c pawn like this, 
in queen's pawn openings which i mean this is essentially a reverse uh queen's pawn opening like you it's kind of known that you shouldn't really like place your knight in front of your c pawn like this like sure the chagorin opening is a thing uh but generally speaking like you, you don't want to put a knight on c6 strategically speaking it just hinders your position a lot like it creates a lot of weaknesses like if you want to play b6 this knight's kind of in the way if you wanted to play c6, console the center like that, once again, the knight's in the way. If you wanted to play c5 and attack the d4 pawn, once again, this knight's a pain in the ass and you want to, like, kick it out of your position by now. Which is why you it's known that you don't really want to, in the queen's pawn openings, for, from the black side, you don't want to block your c pawn like this. And same thing here with reverse colors, you don't want your knight to be seen here, it's not good. And basically here with black, you can just continue playing the normal serve with bishop g4, e6, do your thing, and... Again, though, be careful about playing with like knight takes d4. You want to prepare this with uh, e6 here. Also, if you play bishop takes f3 here, I mean, in this case, it's queen takes d5. So, again, you, you would want to prepare things with e6. Just continue the natural development. And here, I mean, yeah, this knight on c3, it's not helping white's position at all. They can't play c3 and protect this d4 pawn. But uh, it's just worth noting that if your opponent plays this, you should understand that you are already doing very well here. And in a somewhat similar vein, another sort of positional mistake I notice a lot of players do is they try to bring their bishop to b5 here thinking this pin is like dangerous, which in reality it's really not. And uh, there is like a concrete line that's sort of becoming popular at the top level recently, where like if you go bishop g4 here, there's like c4 or something. Uh, but I will say that if you want to avoid this, you can actually play this very clever move, queen a5 check. And you're essentially once again forcing knight white to bring their knight c3 here and once again we've discussed how positionally this isn't so great and if you go further into these positions you play e6 eventually you'll probably bring the queen back because it's not the best place on a5 but neither is this bishop on b5 really from positional point of view like this is very good for for um your black and like for example if bishop g4 just to really understand like how this bishop on b5 is not so great like a lot of people think oh if i take on c6 or something this is good it's it's really not because like if b takes c6 sure in this moment the pawn might look a little bit weak here on c6 but if you go just even a couple moves deeper you're going to eventually find that like okay we castle here we have the bishop here and eventually we're just going to play c5 and get rid of this kind of weak looking c6 pawn so yeah all in all bishop b5 a move that i've seen a fair bit but Really, I've never quite understood, like, apart from c4, maybe getting aggressive, like, then it sort of makes sense why you have the bishop on b5, but otherwise, a lot of people don't do that. They just kind of, like, try and play the similar setup with c3 here that you would do with the bishop on d3, except your bishop on b5, where, I mean, it doesn't really make much sense, because this trade is not ever that appealing, to be honest. But that being said here, what happens if white does do the right stuff with bishop d3? And it's here where I want to show some cool ideas to you guys. So knight c6 to begin with, c3. And one of my favorite lines uh, that really is a very cool idea in the Karakhan, to be honest, is you can go g6 here. And there's a bunch of stuff, the main line is knight f6, we'll talk about that briefly soon. But g6 is a very cool sort of side line, which many players don't know how to handle so well. And one of the key ideas here is not just to play bishop g7, but actually to play bishop f5 here. And you might be like, what on earth is this? Like, why are we giving ourselves double g pawns here? Sorry, double f pawns. But the idea is very important that we are opening the g file here, and that when white castles in the future, we're going to play e6, bishop d6, knight f6, may bring the knight to e4, and this rook will come to g8. We're going to castle queen side here. And all in all, like, black scores really well in these positions on the online database, OTB as well, I think they score quite well. And objectively speaking, I think black might already be doing okay here. Which is why in this position, actually, a lot of people after bishop f5, uh, they don't even bother taking. They might, like, play something like bishop e2 or something, but in those positions, I don't really think black is doing too badly at all. However, that being said, some people might want something a little bit more solid than g6, fair enough, and knight f6 is sort of the main line here. I personally don't play this myself, I find it a little bit boring, but after bishop f4, bishop g4 here, queen b3, queen d7 here, you have these ideas. And a lot of people, I think, uh, will not play bishop d6 because they're afraid of something like bishop takes d6, right? Sorry, this arrow is disastrous. And something like queen takes b7, but this is not at all something to be afraid of. A lot of people cower down and play bishop e7, but if possible, you always want to play the most active move. Of course, that's a generalization, but here that's definitely true. And you should not be scared of queen takes b7, because after rook b8 here, queen a6, uh, it's not even about taking this. I think after bishop b5, that might be slightly troublesome, but we're just going to castle here. And it's important to understand here that 
Now that we're castled here and that we're running rook takes b2 here, and what's very important to understand here is that white's king is still in the center here. They can't just keep trying to hold into this b2 pawn uh, like their life depends on it. For example, if b4 here, you might kind of sit here for a little bit and think, Yo, what does black actually do? They can't really play e5 because after takes takes, we actually just hang our queen, right? But we can prevent that and play rook b6 and only then play e5 here. And it is actually black who has a big advantage here because of our initiative, white pawn matters very little here. Although once again, I should note that, you know, white, they're not forced to take the pawn here. And very often what happens, we get some sort of position like this. White might bring a rook to, to e1. They could also bring the a rook there. And what black's typical plan is in such a position is to go for the minority attack with rook b8, b5 here and gain counterplay on the queen side. Okay, so we're gradually, gradually nearing the end here. Very long video. I uh, hope you guys have been enjoying this one so far, but uh, yeah, we're going into the pan of attack now instead of going for this whole, uh, you know, exchange variation thing with bishop d3 here. And one thing I really want to note to you guys is the ideal setup against the pan of, and that is to play g6. However, you should note that theoretically speaking, this, I'm not sure if it's the best, it's not like refuted or anything, not even close, but... The idea that I really want to drive home to you guys is if white ever plays something like knight f3 here, they are not really playing in the true spirit of the pan of black. Sorry, white has to be very aggressive and they have to really try and keep up their initiative the best they can here. If they just kind of play slow developing moves, especially when we play g6 here, uh, this is not so good. By the way, why is g6 so good? It's because very often we're going to get these sort of isolated queen's pawn positions uh, where, you know, the best setup is to have the Fianchetto here and have this bishop targeting d4 pawn like this, and not to mention we're also blockading the, the d pawn in doing so. But the important point to understand is that strategically, because this is good, white needs to do something very concrete, otherwise this will just be good for, for black really. Uh, and knight f3 is a very common move at the club level. Players don't really understand the sense of urgency. They'll just kind of develop pieces and act like everything's fine. Uh, but very soon we could play something like this, b6 here, bishop b7, rook c8, and all in all, white has very little aggressive prospects in this position. Also, one important thing to understand is that compared to the lines where we play e6, very often what's going to happen is white's going to have a bishop on this diagonal here, targeting our king side, whereas when we play g6, obviously, I mean, like, if they try to do the same thing, I mean, what's the bishop targeting, really? It's just hitting the g6 pawns by granite, really. Very nice position for black, and yeah, in general, the stuff we are playing against the isolated queen's pawn, very pleasant, we can play rook c8, knight f5, maybe attack the bishop a little bit, uh, if possible, like, for example, in a position like this, maybe we could play knight a5, they bring the bishop back, and we could even play move like knight d5, once again, blockading uh, the isolated queen's pawn. In a very similar position to the one we just looked at with, uh, you know, where black played g6 here, is one where black goes knight c6 here, and white goes knight f3, and only then g6 here. And this has some similarities, but the, what I really want to show here is once again, if white plays the slow moves, that's, that's no good. But if they take on d5 here, this is the best move here, knight takes d5, we can really ramp up the pressure here with smooth queen b3. And the whole point is that after knight takes c3 here, white has a very nice move. And I, if you guys were feeling up to it, I highly suggest you pause the video and try and figure out what that is. But the whole idea is that, once again, we don't want to play b takes e3, like, this isn't bad necessarily, but after bishop g7, black can be able to castle safe, we have a fine position where they play against a hanging pawn structure, no problems at all, and, I mean, yeah, it's not something I'd love to play with white, to be honest. However, what white can do in this position is to play bishop c4 instead, creating an intermediate attack against the pawn f7, and, you know, if black tries to escape with their knight here, that just doesn't work here, we get queen e6 check, and at the very least, we're going to be winning back the piece, right? And have a raging attack, being a pawn up, nothing to complain about at all. Which is why in this position, uh, you know, blacks, they're not going to try and be a greedy son of a bitch. They're going to, well, they could play an ID5 here and then go into this thing where they have the bishop here, but they have a weak c6 pawn, or they can go e6 here. Uh, but, I mean, you have to be very careful when doing this, because, like, you know, if you play bishop e7, then there's bishop h6, and if you play bishop g7, there's bishop a3, usually you don't want to combine these moves e6 and g6, and these variations kind of very nicely illustrate as to why. Uh, like, you might have to play something like bishop f8, and, like, basically the, the whole goal is that you, you want white to repeat moves, but they don't necessarily have to. Uh, yeah, so, in general, like, the, the whole idea I want to illustrate here is that when black plays g6 here, white has to really play very quickly, and if they don't, well, as black, you should be quite happy. 
So with that in mind here, once again, coming at this position from the black perspective, we just looked at g6 and how these positions after takes. Takes, queen b3 might not be so pleasant, uh, but the alternative, like bishop g4, which is commonly suggested in many repertoires, like it gets into this position where white essentially gets his forced endgame, where it's sort of very one-sided, it feels like. Black doesn't really have many win chances. Sometimes they do, but it's like, more or less it's either a draw or white wins. Material is equal, but we have this weak d5 pawn, our king's sort of stuck in the center. It's a bit awkward, and I've never been a big fan of these positions, to be honest. Which is why in these positions, one line that I've liked to fear a bit for black is to play bishop e6 over the years. And the main idea is we're just pressuring this pawn here, if white does nothing, we, we take it, we're going to play bishop d5, e6. Have a very solid position with our upper pawn. So the most logical move for uh, white is, well they could play c takes d5, but then bishop takes d5, we are blockading the isolated pawn. We play e6, bishop e7, very solid position. Uh, what the most critical move is for them to play c5. And then generally speaking, I, I think, you know, black can get a somewhat comfortable game by just playing g6, bishop g7, castles. If possible, we would love to play bishop g4, add pressure on this diagonal here, and sort of hammer down on this d4 pawn. But I really just want to show this idea of bishop e6, I think it's pretty cool, it also works well as a surprise weapon, because not a lot of people have studied it seriously, but yeah, it's just a cool thing I'm pointing out there. So, well, so once again, well, I, I've said this a bunch of times throughout this video, but this isn't really meant to be like a theoretical video, like I show some theory to help show some important ideas to really understand the openings, but like once again, we're going to be tying up some kind of loose ends here. And one thing I wanted to look up was the, the two knights variation. And the main move here, and the best one by far, is bishop g4 here. But it's important to understand, like, why don't people just play like they do against a classical variation where uh, white, you know, plays, sorry, black plays bishop f5. And the reason is the pawn uh, is on d2 here. They haven't spent a tempo point d4, and this knight uh, has kind of actively developed out to the g3 square. And that makes a big difference in these variations, because now if we go further, bishop g6, h4, Knight e5 here hits, and this is all of a sudden where you notice a big difference between the other variations, because now after bishop h7, a very strong move for white is to play queen f3 here, and it might look like so what, knight f6. Uh, but if you'd like to try and pause the video and find what white's strong idea is, I suggest you do so. And the idea is that white can play queen b3 now, forking this pawn and this pawn, and the black's actually toast here, white is completely winning. Like for example, if you go queen d5 here, uh, I'm pretty sure you can just take, take, and like if you go bishop e2 I think, I, like I mean you can't save this rook in a8, completely winning for, for white so yeah this is a complete no-go. Which is why in this position people will play bishop g4, knight f6 used to be a thing by the way I used to play this for some kind of advanced reasons it's not so good anymore, but bishop g4 and you essentially get this variation here where uh, black is very solid, if you're looking for a sort of universal game plan just go knight f6, bishop e7, knight bd7, Take on e4, except for when white goes d3, because then they can take back, and that's not super fun. You would rather keep the tension, that, that kind of case. You could also put the bishop on you know, g7, put it that way. That's also very solid. Uh, but in general here, uh, I mean, there's more advanced fury. Sometimes the bishop can come to c5, but if you're looking for something universal, you, you can just like play g6 or you know do this kind of thing and have a fairly solid game. And so another line that you should sort of know what you're doing against is Pseudo Panov, and that there are some important ideas that I want to show here because, uh, you know, white could transpose into the Panov, which is why it's called the Pseudo Panov, uh, but they could also not, and they could play just simply in this position, c takes d5 and e takes d5, and the idea is if white, sorry, black simply recaptures, knight d3, you gain a bunch of tempo, d4, and this is kind of an improvement on the Panov probably. So what black has to do is play knight f6 here, and white could just play knight c3 and, you know, go into this sort of position, we go g6, get good kind of position for the for the panel right that we kind of talked about before uh but a lot of the time white isn't going to do that they're going to play something like bishop b5 check or queen a4 check and the whole point to understand here is that now after something like knight c3 white is really going to try their best to really make sure that we can't easily win back this d5 pawn here but we can just continue doing our thing here and in general I wouldn't be too concerned about these positions, white pieces are kind of mangled up sort of weirdly on the queen side here, and one very important idea to understand is this move a6 here, and some people will try to be Mr. Smarty Pants here with white and play short castles, but you have to understand that we can actually still play b5 here. You might be like, no, no you can't, we can play knight takes b5, but after knight b6, well guess who's winning now because of queen a3 here, a takes b5, and uh, this rook's actually protected here, like the idea of course was okay, they could probably, actually I think that's 
knight takes b5 isn't quite right because here we can get two pieces for the queen sorry two pieces of the rook so bishop takes b5 is probably what they would do and in this case they would win the exchange uh but after bishop takes b5 here knight b6 again and now we just simply are uh, winning the piece here and uh this is obviously no good which is why in this position white has to play something like queen a3 to avoid that for it b5 and now we cannot play b5 for real because there's going to be no knight b6 tempo again but instead we just play b6 bishop b7 uh, and we have a fairly solid position, we can go knight c5 eventually, hopefully regain the pawn on d5 and have a fairly comfortable position. And so finally, the final idea I want to show in this video is what to do against the king's Indian attack. You know, white has a bunch of king's Indian attack stuff they can do against the French, it's quite a viable opening, they can go knight d2 like this, they have their stuff against Sicilian, it's also sort of thin, they go like, you know, g3, d2, and they do stuff, right? But uh, against the Kara Khan, what do we do here? And and it's not too easy, right? Because a lot of the time in the Kara Khan, our gut instinct is like, okay, how do we develop the bishop outside the pawn chain? Uh, but I mean, here, like, what what do we do, right? F5 is not possible. G4 is not possible. Um, if we play like knight gf6 here, we might get kicked back with e5. That doesn't look particularly appealing here. Uh, so what do we do here? And the, the best move for black is actually to simply play e5, gaining as much space in the center, really making use of the fact that white hasn't occupied the center that well themselves here, and if anyone is playing for an advantage in these positions, generally speaking, I would think it to be black. And in general, the positions will generally continue something like uh, knight gf3, bishop d6, we develop some pieces, and this is a very typical position you will get here. Black can maybe expand the queen side a bit. We can maybe bring our queen to c7. Maybe we'll bring a knight c5 to f8, maneuver it this way. Who knows? In general, though, black's doing very solid here. Uh, but it's just important to understand and once again remember that uh, when white goes with this, you want to gain space in the center with e5, not do some weird passive stuff with e6. So holy crap, that was a long video. Um, I didn't know it would take this long to record, but um, yeah, I think this was over an hour long. If you are still at the end of this, that means a lot. Hope you've learned something, you've enjoyed it. Um, please like the video, subscribe, leave a comment down below if there was anything in particular that you found pretty cool, any other ideas that you thought I kind of missed out for so that other people can join in the discussion. Uh, but with that being said, uh, I don't really have much else to say. Please uh, have a good day and I'll see you until next time.